Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, to How We Build This Toronto, uh, which is a webinar series featuring Toronto's uh, leaders in the real estate industry and the story behind the movement they built. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nama Blonder. I'm an architect and urban planner with Smart Density. My co-host is Lyra Kligman, who is the co-founder of the Yorkville team, residential and commercial sales team in Toronto. And uh, the reason we put together this webinar series is to get a chance to talk to the founders of the most successful companies in the, in the industry and in Toronto and ask them how they had an idea and how they brought it from an idea to the successful companies they run today. Um, Lerad, please introduce our guest today. Yes, hello. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Lauren Ha. Uh, with us today. So Lauren Ha is the CEO and broker of record of Zucasa, an award-winning Canadian brokerage. Uh, Zucasa offers intelligent, full-service real estate by using technology to amplify an end-to-end -end experience provided by its in-house real estate agents and team. Um, Lauren's leadership resulted in Zucasa being named one of the fastest growing companies in North and South America by the Financial Times in April 2020. Um, and in 2019, Zucasa was also named one of Canada's fastest growing companies by the Globe and Mail and a tech fast 50 company in Canada by Deloitte. A bit about Lauren. Um, Lauren's an active angel investor in Canada and has over 10 years of entrepreneurial experience prior to acquiring Zucasa. Uh, most recently, she was a founding investor and remains an active director of Rate Hub Inc. and created Scholarhood, Canada's first tool for families searching for home listings by school district. So Lauren, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, so just to start off with, you know, you've, you've invested and built in a diverse set of businesses ranging from, you know, painting homes, educating children, helping people with mortgages, helping them buy and sell homes. Um, is there a common red thread, thread between all of those? And, and what is it that really drives you forward? Yeah, great question. I actually, when you were saying it, I was thinking of how they're all actually quite linked. Um, and so my operational, I can take no credit on the rate hub side. I'm just a very happy investor and board member. So I've never sold a mortgage, just understand how they're, how they're doing it. But um, so my biggest ones, I actually started in with a college pro franchise, uh, franchise back in, uh, back in university. Um, so I started painting homes and then educating children and working um, with children and then moved into selling homes. And they're all very similar. So they're all dealing with um, something that they, the client values the most, right? the children being the, the most important. Um, but really I've, I've always been in a service industry. Um, so, so all three of these companies are service-based. So you go in and you sell whatever the service is and then you need to make sure that you're hiring and training the team that's going to provide the service that you promise. Um, and really that, that would be the theme is they're all very high valued service, uh, service industry. Mm. Right. There we go. What okay. is it that, that drives you um, in entrepreneurship? Um, you know, are you one of those people that was never looking for an employment by a company? Is it, is it something that's sort of within you that, you know, makes you drive towards entrepreneurship? It's interesting. Yeah. And I mean, the last time I was an employee, I was um, teaching swimming lessons in high school. So that's a, <laughs> that is a I, I don't know if I'm employable anymore, quite frankly, but um, the, what drives it? I think uh, I got, I got hooked in those college pro days. So um, it was really interesting being 18 and having a team of that my first year I had eight painters. Um, all of my painters were students. They had to pay their tuition the next year. And so just having the the responsibility of being able to sell enough jobs and organize them so that they were earning income to be able to pay their tuition. Um, I enjoyed that. There was something about that level of responsibility and coordination and, and providing great summer jobs for, uh, for my students who essentially were my peers at that, at that time. Um, and I was, I was hooked. Um, you also then, so that year was really, really hard um, in terms of, just hours and the learning curve and, and that repeated itself again when I started in college pro and it repeated itself again in, in um, real estate. So I don't know what it is, but I seem to be attracted to or addicted to these kind of 24 <laughs> seven businesses uh, where you roll up the red carpet for clients. Um, and I don't know if that's uh, inflicting some self pain or what, what it is, but um, it, it, 
um, I just happened into it. And there, there was something in that first summer that just really clicked with me and that, um, you know, helping people have, like helping my staff and my team kind of grow and have a great summer um, that I've I've always enjoyed. So when we were building our team at Oxford, the same, so it was an Oxford Learning Center that I uh, ran. I opened the one at Young and St. Clair in Toronto. Um, and again, something about building that team and some of, I, we had a, a mix there of part-time and full-time staff um, and kind of giving them the opportunity to grow and either be their, you know, next step into teaching or be their um, kind of my, you know, my master's, my PhD students for moonlighting and tutoring and, um, you know, Really connecting them with a vocation that they enjoyed, um, and then getting into real estate. It's a, I mean, you're you're in real estate as well, so you know that the unfortunately in our industry the, the bar can be quite low. Uh, so so the bar to getting your license is low, um, and there's 79,000 real estate agents in Ontario. Um, many, if not most, of them have full time jobs and are. Um, I would say not the best um, option for most home buyers and sellers. And so it's, it's always just been really important to me to surround our team and build a team of active full-time professionals um, who can offer the best advice and the best service. Um, and there's, anyways, I think I'm just nattering for you, but it's always been about building that, building that team. I have fun creating those cultures. So can you, talk about the early days and also I, so I'm going to have two questions in one kind of but you're one of the probably first startups in one of the most low low tech industries out there real estate uh, how did you you know had the vision how did you have the vision to unite tech with real estate and if you can take us through the steps of founding Zucasa yeah so I think an important piece um just to clarify is we actually purchased Zucasa from Rogers back in 2015. Um, and I, so didn't, didn't found it. They were essentially a lead generation company that for all intents and purposes sold leads um, to agents across the country. Um, we, because of my background with Rate Hub, and then I've been actively selling real estate for a few years, hoping to create something like a Zucasa that when they put it up for sale, it was just really serendipitous timing. Um, so, the, the important piece, I think, um, for any for our type of like uh, company is we are really a tech-enabled service company. So we are um, as soon as you, you you know we use tech to enable our people online to find past sold data, to to do some research, to understand trends, to see past photos, and um, give our users online what they want. And then when they are looking to connect with an agent we then create a human experience. So we're actually, you know, we call them and we're, we're providing that, you wanna book an appointment, like it becomes very traditional. Um, and and right now, you know, we're not a discount brokerage because in the way that the industry works right now, if you're a discount brokerage, you attract discount agents. So you're not gonna have the best quality agents generally, in my opinion, with, um, with a discount model right now. Um, so we're actually using technology to enable the best agents. I've got, I shouldn't quote a number right now, but um, you know my top ten agents, I believe, are all in the top one percent of Toronto real estate agents. So we've got a, a really solid group of really high performing, you know, doing five, seven deals a month, um, whereas your average agent's doing, I don't know, four a year. Lerad can kind of talk about that. Yeah, yep, about um, five to six a year. Yeah, full time, right? And and but your average actual agent's doing one. So we've really used um, like your average. Licensed agent does about one per year. Your average um, full-time agent does somewhere in the yeah, four to six range. It's hard to, it's not tracked perfectly. Um, whereas, you know, our top agents are doing five, six, seven in a month. Um, so we're using technology to enable them. And part of it is that online lead generation portion. And then part of it is in the back end, our CRM and our, our contact system so that we're connecting the agents with the clients and the, with the least friction possible. Um, so we can then provide the best service. Um, let's talk about, you know, website and marketing of website, because we talked about it with, um, with one of the guest speakers in the past. We all know with, uh, it was with Monica from Ratio City. We all know that you don't have a website and, and magic happens and people get, uh, and it gets traffic. Can you speak to how you, and you can take it from the early days or even, you know, up until today, how you make a website get 
traffic and make sure that it's not just on the cloud? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So we, and, and it's interesting because when you started the podcast, you're doing the introductions, you talk about, you know, you start with an idea and now you're successful. And quite frankly, I don't feel that way. I feel very much like these are the early days. So, um, you know, we're five years in and it feels very early and very uh, scrappy still. Um, so, you know, we might be 5X where we were five years ago, but it still um, feels very, uh, you know, painful, chaotic growth. Um, so I don't want to in any way, shape or form say this as though like we're, we're here, we're at the pinnacle. Um, so what I would say that we've done really well on building traffic is our, our marketing team and getting earned media. So the reports that we put out um, are often picked up by you know, post media and by the star properties and, and will be sent across um, in, into the global mail and the, like the, the properties like that, um, where you're then picked up and the recognition um, leads people to the site through, you know, some SEO magic. Um, we, we did a great job when we first relaunched the site in 2016 of, we were really market leaders on a feature um, perspective with kind of some past sold information um, the ability to view better quality photos, some more information. Where they, we're still the only place where you can in Toronto where you can actually see homes within school districts. So not what's the nearby school, but what is the actual catchment area for this school? And um, as anybody in real estate knows, it's very very important um, for for families when they're picking their homes. Um, where we need to evolve and where you know you. Um, you've got to be careful where you're putting gas on the pedals is, you know, we spent most of last year building a lot of our backend infrastructure and our um, CRM. And we took our foot off some of the, the like, features that we really need on the front end. Um, and I also, when you talk early days, you know, where are the pain points? Well, I'm a service provider. I, I, I am not a technologist. Um, and so one, something I've learned in the last five years is we should have hired um, someone to lead the technology piece. I'm not talking, we've got a CTO and he's fantastic and he's like, but he's the head of engineering, but someone to actually overarching lead technology in terms of lining it up with the business, uh, if that makes some sense. So, um, so where we're at right now is we hired somebody last November um, and the amount of change that she's been able to bring onto the technology build and process side um, since November has meant that we're actually now coming back into a leadership position from a features um, subset for people when they're they're using uh, for people using the site. Um, anyways, I I've been nattering for so long I don't even totally remember your question. But um, how do we get people to the site? There's SEO um, has two parts. One of them is kind of getting links and outbound recognition. Um, one of them is technologically making sure your site is set up so that the, the search sites, AKA Google, um, actually use, uh, um, can point and find your site easily. Um, we've done very well on the outbound uh, marketing piece and we have this year been greatly improving the, <laughs> the actual technology SEO portion. That's so great. Success, we're not there yet, working on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and I think it's important to to always recognize your your strengths and and the areas that require a little bit of growth, and just constantly pivot and make sure that you're you're adapting and not resting on the laurels. So that's that's great. Um, can you give an example of a, of a significant challenge or obstacle that you encountered since 2015? Um, maybe it was a significant issue that's a, <laughs> just one, two, however many you'd like, but just one that sort of you know made you question, um, you know, what you're doing and, and, you know, it was sort of a foundational experience. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it almost goes into what I was just saying about leadership on the technology side. So um, two pieces that go into that, there's the old adage that, um, you know, sometimes the people that got you here won't be the ones to get you the next five years. Um, what's interesting is we've actually, we've got an amazing team of people who I think will actually take us through the next five years as well but we were missing that overarching leadership. And so something that has been really painful in the, in the last year, and, and not painful is the wrong word, but it's, it's difficult when, so we had an incredible director of marketing, an incredible CTO, we've got, but to bring someone in over them um, to kind of be the umbrella for all things technology that then also weave into the brokerage side, um, it's really challenging. I mean, somebody that used to put, report directly to me now has a different, um, like having a different relationship and a different boss, um, it it creates 
a lot of change. And we, because we were a relatively small team and we, um, change is just hard. So even when it's for the best and we're now putting out features and putting out, um, you know, improving the performance of the site um, and everybody is learning more because, um, so Carrie Lysenko, who we brought in as our uh, COO to kind of run the technology side, um, she has more experience than any of us ever had and has actually run 200 person engineering teams before. So um, it's, it's good change, but that doesn't make it easy. Um, so the last year of kind of working through process change so that we can grow and scale another 5X in the next five years has been um, challenging. And, and how do you stay ahead of that, uh, of the curve and figure out, you know, it's obviously it's a, it's a very fast changing business. And like Nama mentioned, it's, um, you know, an industry that's, that's slow to accept technology. So, uh, but I think it's going to change significantly over the next five years. So how do you maintain your leadership and, and ensure that you're really riding, riding the, the forefront of that wave? That's a great question. So, I, um, so what we're working on right now when we're building our roadmap for the next five years and who we want to be, um, it is continuing to, our, our belief is that the agent will exist in five years. So we are going to have more technology integrated into the process. Um, I believe in five years there will be fewer agents doing more, more deals, um, individual, like more, fewer individuals doing more deals each um, because the who is going to survive in this change are going to be um, enabled. However, the agent will still exist, I believe, in real estate, in mortgages, in financial planning. There are just things where I don't, I'd love to hear your opinion as well, Lirad, where users online, you know, people when they are doing research, want data, they want technology, they want things to be easy and seamless, but home buyers and sellers then want a human to give them advice. And on not just here's what the trend line says, here is what the data is, here's how you can just you know use your phone to open up a door. They actually want to hear from someone who has been through it 30 to 50 times in the last year alone, how should I approach this? What does that trend line mean? Where is the market gonna go from here? And computers don't give, and computers and AI value, you know, an, an actual market valuation is very different than where will my family be happy? What is the school zone like? I've heard this about the principal. Like, there's just so many hyper local um, pieces that it, that when people are making in Toronto a one, two, three million dollar plus investment in homes and condos, they want an expert to hold their hand and say, "This is how we're going to do it. You're doing the right thing." Um, so in terms of where it's going, so to answer your question um, of how we're staying ahead, it, so that, so we've decided our company, we believe great agents are the future. So, you know, versus some of our competitors, we're focused on a smaller team of highly productive agents. So a small team of great advisors. Um, we're then building the technology and processes so that they can um, be the most efficient and give the best service for, for their clients and only focus on, on the portions that are actually high value to the clients. Everything that's not high value to the clients, we can make easier with technology. So um, so for us, it's more about using technology to enable the service versus using technology to be the service, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of road mapping and staying ahead, we obviously look at you know direct competitors and features and what are you know what do people like how are people you can use heat maps what are people using on on our online competitors um but we also look to other industries so as we're building what we're doing in 21 we're actually looking at you know some retail spaces and looking at some so like online retail experiences and online um hoteling experiences and look at like look at travel look at other industries to see how they're using um UX to display information and to guide people through a research process or to guide people through, you know, we're looking at retail, a cart process. So it's, if you only look at your, you know, direct competitors, you'll always be paying catch up. So we're trying to make sure that we've got what people do expect and want today and be thoughtful about what they're looking for in the future. It's an excellent answer. Yeah, thank you for that. And I 100% agree with you that uh, traditionally the agent is sort of worn a hundred different hats. And, you know, we're human, we have strengths in some areas and weaknesses in others, and it's impossible to do everything really well and efficiently. So the fact that you're still keeping the human element where 
it performs at its highest value, but you're transferring technology over to those sort of more operational items, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Lauren, you're our first speaker that actually operates uh, across Canada, um, uh, so which is amazing. But I can you tell us uh, how how you reached a point when you uh, when you actually operate across you uh, the website operates across the country and um, I'm assuming you started in Toronto. I don't know, but um, for. for and, and we ask that question, I, I think, almost all the guest speakers. And, and sometimes it seems that the Vancouver and the West Coast, like Europe would be closer than Vancouver, uh, mentally. Can you, I, I'm, I'm actually really curious to, to hear your thoughts on operating um, uh, nationally and what are the challenges that you are facing, you know, being from Toronto in, uh, on the West Coast? So I will, um, I, I think we might have information wires crossed. We do not operate in Vancouver. So um, we, the site is in Vancouver. So we, we have a team of partner agents, but we do not offer our actual agent services currently in Vancouver. That was a Q4, that was on our Q4 roadmap before COVID hit for this year, but that has made it a bit difficult for me to get on a plane and <laughs> get out west. Um, but I, I can speak to, so to kind of be able to answer your question um, with something of interest, Rate Hub um, and our financial services um, company underneath that, Ganwise Financial, is national. And we do have agents that operate from coast to coast um, in the mortgage world. So I, I can answer some of the questions of the challenges and successes we've had there, because that's informing our roadmap to be there with, with agents' boots on the ground, so to speak, um, into, I'm hoping, 21, because um, it was our it was on our 20, uh, on our 20 roadmap. Um, it, it all comes down to leadership. So, I mean, there's, there, as you're building any company, the only thing that's going to matter is who's steering that ship. And when you go into somewhere like Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, just into other, because you mentioned West, so I'm, I'm leaning West, um, you need somebody on the ground that's going to be able to hire and recruit and run, run a great shop, like a culture um, that you've got that's working in your home base. And so, everything will start at the top as we go to look out west. Um, and we, we've seen this um, previously as I, we took Canwise across the country, um, that it, it all comes down to the leader. So the right leader can work within your system and then make adaptive changes that make sense for their market. Um, but that leader principally needs to be recruiting, training, and managing your systems with a, with a geographical twist. Um, and so as we look to expand boots on the ground into the West, um, it, it'll all be about me connecting with, you know, partner leadership out there. We usually ask what advice you could give to entrepreneurs, but I want to narrow it down. And what advice, because not any, you know, real estate, and it's highly competitive, as you said, I, you know, architecture is highly competitive enough. What advice could you give for agents and brokers that specifically that obviously don't have the ability to to go into you know the tech or um, even having the platform that you uh, established? How how what advice could you give in such competitive uh, industry? How to stand out, marketing, take it whatever you want to take it. Yeah, I mean, a, a personal plug is come join us because we can take care of that for you. <laughs> but um, the, the, yeah, I mean, speaking, anybody that's going to be in any industry, so yourself included, if you are going to be running your business, which a lot of traditional independent agents, they are really running small businesses. And so lead generation and, and funneling new people, new names into your, into your funnel, into your pipeline um, is paramount. And that, and that goes for Nama, that, that's in, in architecture, that's in, if you're a lawyer, like all there's, you know, business development and, and generating a new book of clients is vastly important. So there are, use whatever skill you have to generate that pipeline. So some people, we, we happen to be great at generating clients online. We then at our brokerage in-house, I've got six full-time agents who all they do is is call 
Um, so they're doing the inside call. So our agents don't even have to call through online leads, which kind of have a bad rap in the industry. Um, we're booking appointments directly into our agents' calendars. So again, to make sure that that the agents are just working with clients, like they are just out working with clients because that is what they're really good at. Um, so for any agent um, who's looking to get started or any broker, you focus on what you're good at to be able to build a pipeline of names. And for some people that's, you know, pre, pre COVID, um, that was door knocking for some people that's going to be running a campaign online for some people. That's just, if you've got 50 people, you know, call it your top 50. If you've got people, 50 people who know and love you, you can build, start building a really great business from that. Um, so our agents use our, our agents really focus on two things, which is the new names that get added to their pipeline. They kind of you know, let outsource that to us. So they're at our brokerage because they're outsourcing that portion of the new client generation, book me appointments, and then they all focus on their repeat and referral business. And so our model really is set up such that they, we, we were like, we worry about their new name generation from the out, like people that don't know them for them. And then they focus on repeat and referral business on the people that already do know them. So they focus on the top 50. We focus on giving them new names to continue to add that base. Um, and so anybody that's in the industry really should have two sources of, of new leads. One is the repeat and referral, work your, work your, work your sphere, right? Work your base. This is kind of real estate 101. Um, and then find one other avenue to generate new people into the pipeline. Just one. All new agents start thinking, like, okay, well, I'm going to go door knocking and they door knock two times. And then they, I'm going to do open houses. They do one open house. I'm going to do leads online. They do leads online for one day. There's, there's this kind of like, I'm going to do everything. Um, whereas if agents just focus on two, one is repeat and referral and one is something else and then become a master at that something else and a master at repeat and referral, you'll have a good business. I, I love your point about focus on the one thing and do it really well. I wonder, um, so it sounds like a lot of your lead generation is based on, you know, online ads and, and sort of getting warm leads that way. Um, do you also focus on, you know, content creation and, and building a brand in terms of sort of your presence? Um, you know, Zucasa, whether it be, you know, webinars or blogs, you know, content creation, is that a function of, of what you guys do as well? Yeah, so I actually, it's actually reversed. So we don't do a lot of ads. I, I oh, okay. spend very, very little on, on ads. Um, so we, so it's actually the reverse. So most of ours is brand building. So it's that name recognition, it's webinars, it's the blog. Like our, um, our newsletter is 120, so I don't know what it is now, but it's over 120,000 um, subscribers. And it's, um, and our open rate is industry, is almost triple the industry wide because the content that we're putting it out is quite valuable. Um, so that's some of what I was talking about with the reports that we build. Um, you know, we were picked up by Post Media for a report we put out um, Friday or Monday, but it got you know it was sent out I think Monday. Um, and and sometimes our, those reports we put out will get 200, 300, 1200 um, media hits. And so that that has been our strategy right now. And so 99% of our traffic and leads are actually organic. So they either go directly to zucasa.com or they search. You know, homes for sale in Toronto, and we come up first, and they find us through that. That's amazing. Yeah, that's I mean, great. But the, but the online ads um, is a huge opportunity for us because right now we've proven that we can convert users into clients very well. So we now need to build the institutional kind of knowledge and strength in the ads department because it's relatively low hanging fruit. Um, so that's uh, that's on our twenty one plan is to to be able to optimize that. I can also speak actually to that because uh, what I liked about Zucasa, so uh, we actually did content swap uh, twice when I provided um, like professional, I, I don't remember, summary about, you know, big shifts that happen in the industry oh and God. Zucasa contributed to my blog. And, and not only that it's fair, it's much stronger uh, in terms of SEO and I, I think it's very wise. Um, my last question would be uh, that you actually mentioned SRM twice, sorry, CRM twice, uh, which means that uh, it, it, it is a very, and, and I'm guessing as a, you know, an online or tech uh, business, you have the ability or uh, capacity to, to have a very strong uh, CRM because of all the data you collect. 
can you give some tips for the low tech uh, guys out there how to really work with uh, CRM? Um, how do you utilize it? How you keep it? Uh, how you collect it? What's the, the best part of having a strong CRM? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I think that the stats on agents using CRMs are shockingly low. So it, it's only something, I think something like 15% of agents have a CRM and five to 10% use them. So um, everyone else is like back of the napkin. You're just kind of like running fly by night and you will lose business because of that. So um, again, I, I'm kind of like quoting these stats that I think are like I believe they're all from NAR, so the National Association of Realtors, which is the American version of CREA, essentially, which is the Canadian uh, Real Estate Association. So um, some of the NAR stats will say, so for any like online lead that you generate right now, 15% of them will move in the next six months. 85% of them are gonna be six months to two years. And so if you are not you know, actively working on connecting and staying top of mind for those 85%, then you're really just scraping the surface of all of what you're creating. Um, so the, the CRM needs to really work to keep, to make sure that you don't forget people. <laughs> like it's really that simple. Um, and so as a company, we use the CRM on the inside um, to make sure that we're main, we, you know, we can work with buyers and sellers as, as they work through our process. Some of the people who actually sign up and say, hey, I wanna see this house tomorrow, have been on the site for four years, right? People start doing research long before they make moves. Um, and so that's the inside. Now our outside for our agents, the CRM really for them, um, you know, there's a Gary Keller who was the founder of um, Keller Williams and um, was an incredible visionary in our industry. Um, he, he still to this day says the best CRM is cue cards with a pen and paper and phone like if you use it all this the CRM just needs to make sure you are staying in touch with your clients it is that simple so the best CRM is the one that you use um and so some so for us our CRM actually is fairly feature light uh, because we before we built our own we're on Salesforce which had a bajillion features and it's almost so overwhelming that that then it gets harder to use so our the our dashboard and our, our CRM, we call it Agent One, and the, the, where the agents go in and they use it, the dashboard is fairly light so that they are able to just focus on the, the really important piece of stay in touch with your clients. Great. Um, we always ask our, uh, our speakers, is there one book, either in business or you know, a fiction book that, that really inspired you? Um, and I know we didn't bring it up in advance, so if, if you can't, uh, if you don't have one, that's fine. But if there's anything that you can recommend to uh, to our audience, um, or a podcast, that, whatever yeah. it is that you yeah. find inspiration uh, for your business, I am um, okay. Inspiration for business. So, so I started going down the other the other chain. So I read a lot. I have to read to fall asleep. So I um um I try, and I actually kind of track and remember. So, um, I. I listen to books for um, that are business books because I find them, they're not really, I don't, you know, 9.30 at night, 10.30 at night, I don't want to be reading <laughs> the good to great. Um, it's, not, it's just, that's not me. So I use, I use my time commuting to the office to, to listen to business books. So I'd say on the, on the business front, the two that I've enjoyed the most this year and have then purchased for my leadership team and we talk about and we're integrating, those two are deep work. I think it's Cal Newport. My, I think it's Cal. Um, so deep work, and it's really just all about sectioning your days so that, and essentially saying that everyone has two to four hours a day where they can focus and be creative and do output. So we switched up the way that our whole company does meetings. We switched up the way that people block schedule their time around some of the deep work philosophies. Um, and the other one is the is who. So it's just who, W-H-O. Um, oh, who's that one by? Oh, I can't remember, but it's the A method for hiring. Um, and we're starting to integrate that into our hiring and recruiting process. Um, and it's very, what I like about both of them is they are theoretical and here's how it can work. And then very practical, here is how to do it. And both of those this year have had the most impact on, on our business and operations. Um, and then for me, what's the, the best book I've read that wasn't business this year? Um, there's a book, um, it's incredibly sad, but incredibly inspirational. Um, called When Breath Becomes Air. 
um, and it was Paul Callan, Callanan, um, and it was, it's, I believe it's a must read. Um, and it just, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very humbling book and reading it, I, I wanted to be a better human and a better parent. Um, so I, I, if you read one book this year, make it when breath becomes air. Um, and if you have time for some business books, then deep work and, and who. Okay. Yeah, I was just making notes. I, I wanted to, uh, you sold me on that When Breath Becomes Air book. It's sad, it but it's amazing. Um, so uh, so that, that's awesome. So just to wrap up, um, final question for me. If there is one piece of advice over your many years of uh, entrepreneurial experience that you would like to pass on to the next generation of young entrepreneurs that are in the early phases and they're just really hungry and looking to build something amazing, um, what would that be? Just one piece? Um done is better than perfect. So get it out, get it out fast, do it. Just, just do it. Wise words. All right. Well, that, uh, that wraps us up. So Lauren, thank you so much for, for spending the time with us today and sharing your incredible insights. Um, we see only great things for the next years ahead for Zucasa and, uh, yeah, excited to touch base and see how things evolve. So, um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, for the next session, we have Leif Moore, uh, founder and uh, CEO of Our House. That's on Tuesday, October 6th at 11 a.m. Um, so hope you can all join us again and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lauren.